Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You're all very welcome to the 18th webinar in the Irish Bioenergy Association webinar series. Uh, this morning, we're delighted to be joined by Green Generation, who will present um, to today's webinar. Our title of uh, today's webinar is Green Generation, an organisation harnessing the circular economy to decarbonise Ireland. Before we get into the presentation, just a brief introduction to what uh, RBA is. Um, as we have a, a very large attendance this morning and quite a few new participants uh, who, haven't, who haven't joined us before. So we are the uh, representative body or organisation for the Irish bioenergy industry in the island of Ireland. Uh, we cover uh, biomass, the biogas, biofuels, biochar, wood fuels and energy crop sectors. Um, our main work is in policy lobbying and advocacy and we have a broad and diverse membership. We roll out a number of research projects and further information is available on our website, erbia.org. This is the 18th webinar in our webinar series. Um, all the previous webinars are available to view on our website and our webinar series takes place fortnightly um, at this time on a Wednesday. So our next webinar will take place uh, in two weeks time. If you would like to uh, find out further information, feel free to get in touch with myself or indeed uh, Teresa O'Brien. Um, Teresa uh, will be able to uh, provide information also to you about membership of the organisation. Um, so this morning's agenda, um, as I said, I will just do a brief opening. Um, my name is Sean Fine and I'm the CEO of the Irish Bioenergy Association. Uh, we will have a presentation by Teresa Patton from Green Generation, and then we will have a panel discussion uh, where we'll be joined by Billy Costello of Green Generation and Old Gavigan of Arbia uh, to take part in that panel discussion. Uh, you can ask questions yourself, uh, and if you could post them through the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen, we'll endeavour to answer as many of them as possible during the course of the webinar, um, and um, happy to take your feedback and your comments. The next webinar will take place on the 24th of March um, from 9.30 to 10.30 and our speaker will be from Bioenergy Europe and full details will be published in the coming week on our social media channels. We thank you again for joining this morning's webinar and we hope you can join us uh, on future webinars. So an introduction to this morning's um, topic and discussion, uh, Green Generation is based in County Kildare and delivering for the circular bioeconomy um, by generating energy from waste for a number of years. Um, it's a rural business focusing on anaerobic digestion technology to convert food waste into renewable gas. This biogas is upgraded to biomethane and pr to produce electricity and also transport fuel and produce heat. Um, Green Generation has involved a number of partnerships, including Paltech, um, who are um, involved in the global plastics um, uh, technology. Uh, we will find out more about that on the webinar. Uh, we will hear about how the upgrading of biogas to biomethane and how it can be used as a transport fuel for trucks and for direct injection to the national gas grid. And then the panel discussion will focus on the challenges of decarbonizing our energy system and how renewable gas facilities like this one at, in County Kildare um, are partnering with companies like Tesco for food waste and plastic recycling is a, another uh, output from the uh, site. Um, so, um, without further ado, we move on to introduce our speaker this morning. So, Teresa Patton is our speaker. Teresa is a recent MBA graduate at TU Dublin and has a very professional background, uh, having qualified in a BA in interior architecture. Um, she has travelled extensively through the South Pacific and UK in the 2000s and returned and has been involved in the food and beverage industry uh, for the last number of years. Upon completion of her MBA, Teresa started working with Gene Green Generation as its program manager and is <clears throat> involved in many aspects of the running of the business and implementing um, the circular economy by using food waste to produce clean, renewable uh, energy. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, and hand over to Teresa, who will take you through her presentation. And then after Teresa's presentation, as I said, we will uh, speak with Billy, Teresa and Noel um, in a panel discussion and answer whatever questions you may have. So over to you, Teresa. I'll stop sharing and um, hand over to you. Thank you, Sean. And I just one second while I share my screen.
No, Sean, can you see that okay? I can just see the Green Generation logo, yes. Um, so good to go. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks very much. Um, thanks, Sean, and uh, thank you to Erbia and Sean and Teresa, especially for having us on here today. As Sean said, I work for uh, Green Generation and we're based in Kildare and we turn food waste into biomethane or renewable gas and we turn uh, mixed waste plastics into high value products. Um, so before we get going today, I'd like to give you a bit of a rundown on what we're going to be talking about. Um, first of all, we'll take a deep dive on the circular economy. Um, we're big believers in it um, and its benefits to the renewable sector um, and, ac and across industry as a whole. Um, then I'll bring you through who Green Generation are, how we got started and what we're all about. Um, the next step then is the process of what we do on site, the real practical stuff. And the ins and outs of our AD and our plastics business. And then finally, we'll, we'll brief, briefly wrap up um, with Green Generation's next steps and um, how we hope to get there and how we see the sector evolving with the panelist discussion. And so first of all, the, the circular economy is in its most basic sense, um, aims to look beyond the current take, make, waste, extractive industrial model. And um, the, the premise is that we need to decouple economic activity from the consumption of finite resources while also designing waste out of the system. Um, this is underpinned by a drive to transition to renewable energy sources. Um, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization shows us that materials for new products um, come from old products. Everything is reused and remanufactured um, and as a last result, resor resort excuse me, is recycled back into um, a raw material are used as a renewable energy source. Um, this circular economy empowers us to use what we have first and to rethink how we see products and in turn how we see these products as a raw material. So we should always first try to reduce what we use and only produce what we need, I think is, is the key one there. So in, in the past number of years, the circular economy has become a really hot topic. Um, it's central to seven of the UN's sustainable development goals seen here. Um, and these SDGs are seen as a starting block on which countries can build their climate change agendas. Um, we're involved directly with five of these um, circular economy um, SDGs. Um, and also it's it's what the European Green Deal is built on. So the European Green Deal sets out to see Europe as the globe's first climate neutral um, continent, boosting economy, improving quality of life and caring for nature, all of those things um, involved. Now, Ireland isn't doing that well. You can see us there um, fifth to last. Um, so we've, we've lagged behind in tackling climate change um, greenhouse gases in transport, building and agriculture sectors have traditionally been very high and they're on a rising trend. Um, Ireland, instead of really focusing on our own bioeconomy, has been busy buying credits from our Scandinavian cousins um, in order to, to meet our targets. So what we see is paying out money to, to other countries for their, their tokens. We can be using that in our own bioeconomy and get, that, um, get the focus back on there. I mean, things aren't all bad and things are looking up now with the Greens in power, we really should be able to see a change in the right direction. So food waste is with our plastics business, is, is, it's a two pronged thing. So just to give you a, an idea of the scale of the problem, 33% um, of all food produced globally is wasted, which in, in some academic papers goes as far up as 45%. Um, on a local level, that's 1 million tonnes of food waste um, per year in Ireland, which equates to about 117 kilograms of food waste per household. Um, in terms of the commercial food waste sector, or the commercial food sector, sorry, that's a quarter of a million tonnes at an estimated cost of 300 million, which is fairly astronomical. Um, if food waste were, its, were a country, it would only come third after, the chi after China and the US in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we're really talking about um, a double-headed monster there. So not only are we wasting the food, but we're also emitting greenhouse gases from that. Um, <clears throat> across Europe, excuse me, um, it's shown the, the Euro European Biogas Association has shown that only 7% of 
80 plants across Europe are using food waste as their feedstock. So while it's a problem on one side, there really is the potential to, to curb or make it an opportunity on the other. Um, and a recent study by the American uh, Environmental Protection Agency has shown that food waste has shown the potential to have three times the methane production of some biosolids. And on a good news story, um, the European Commission has brought out a paper saying that um, Ireland has the highest potential in Europe for the production of renewable gas, which is, you know, it's a good news story and we really need to be looking for those as well. So in terms of the food hierarchy, food waste hierarchy, um, I think we can all agree that prevention would be ideal, but having done a thesis on this, the problem is, is too big and too complex for any one actor or organisation to fix. Um, the, the scale of food loss at production side and food waste at consumer side is too large. Um, so we do an awful lot of research in this and the Food, uh, food and Agriculture Organization of the UN is where we get a lot of our facts and figures. Um, below that then is Food Cloud. So we have a really nice relationship with Food Cloud where any food that can, and they work directly with Tesco, any food that can be um, redistributed to feed people go straight to them and anything that can't be sent um, to their charity partners comes to us then and we get we dispose of it for for food cloud so then this is where green generation comes in and we we're really pulling the food waste out at a higher value um, the highest value we can get it so along with um, uh, feeding the pigs we have an adjacent pig farm we also take any unavoidable food waste um, and turn it into renewable energy through anaerobic digestion. Um, the other side of our business then is the plastic side. So I'll give you a few facts and figures around that. Um, 8 million tonnes of plastic ends up in the ocean every year, which is um, an extraordinary amount of plastics to end up in the ocean. Um, Ireland produces more plastic waste per person in the EU and we've also been found recently to have the fourth lowest recycling rate of plastics in the EU as well. Um, I remember when I was growing up I used to always hear about the great specific garbage patch but now there is actually five across the globe so we're in the North Pacific, the Indian Ocean, South Pacific, South Atlantic and North Atlantic. So these are five distinct regions of the globe where there are garbage patches in the middle of the ocean. And um, we all know that plastics is a really bad thing, but it's really about tackling the problem and changing the way we talk about it um, that will get us to the next stage. Um, and if we keep going the way we're going, by 2050, there will be more fish in the oceans than, sorry, more plastics in the oceans than fish. Now, so this is us. Um, a lot of you will know uh, Billy Costello. He's a fairly well-known uh, pig farmer in Ireland. Um, Green Generation as a company has grown fairly organically over the years. Um, and it came out of a need to process uh, pig slurry on the farm, which we were then able to turn into um, renewable energy to heat the piggery. Um, and so Green Generation was born. Um, the business model adjusted from there and now we process both agri and food waste uh, to produce renewable energy um, and the country, uh, the company has grown through innovation and sustainability and there's a one thing that struck me is that there's a growth mindset within the company that plays an integral part in everything we do. Um, for those of you in the know, and I know that the audience will be fairly clued in on this, but um, for anyone who doesn't know what AD is, um, it's a process that is the microbial breakdown of organisms in the absence of oxygen. So much like in a cow's stomach, there's a four stage process where biogas is produced. Um, now we, we upgrade that biogas into renewable gas. And then the other product that's left over in the process is um, digested. So that's used locally on farms as a high quality eco fertilizer. We also have some international business um, shortly after the re reunification of Germany and um, Billy and his brother Pat headed off to Germany, which I wouldn't say an awful lot of people were doing. And um, again, setting up a pig farm, we had our first AD plant in Germany in 2005. And then Paul and Stephen here are Billy's sons. They took over German operations in 2010 in very sunny Germany. And again, this, this growth mi mindset um, 
runs through the company. So they, the lads bought a dairy and tillage farm in 2014 and have innovated from there and have taken on a, a new type of uh, a New Zealand process where they are now, they have the, the cows uh, grazing outside all year round. And they've recently won an innovation prize for that as well, which is great. And lastly, on the innovation part, um, we were delighted to have won the SEAI um, deployments of uh, renewable energy last year, which is great. And uh, Dr. Stephen Nolan, our plant manager, um, is one is leading a team, one of the 15 teams nominated to take part in Science Foundation Ireland's Future Innovator Prize that focuses on sustainable solutions in the area of food waste and plastic. So really, we're trying, we're really trying to um, back ourselves in terms of innovation and, and doing the right thing. So this is us. This is an aerial view of us in Nerny. And um, just at the number one there, you'll see a black truck coming in. Um, and in terms of our process, this black truck will take a slight left coming in and he will get, he or she um, will be weighed on a weigh bridge. So everything we do in Nerny is backed by data. So all food coming in is weighed on the weigh bridge. It's brought to number two there, which is um, the intake shed. So if it's food that's been packaged from the likes of Tesco, um, it'll get sorted on a picking line where food goes one way, plastic goes the other, and we separate it from there. Um, once the food is separated, it, um, the AD process happens where it all breaks down. It's turned into biogas in the dome at the back, and then we renew, we uh, upgrade it then to renewable gas at number five, where we can transport it straight to Kush. So Kush um, is about nine kilometers from Green Generation, and it's Ireland's first and only dedicated renewable injection point, which is something we're, we're, that we're really proud of. And with um, 2030 and 2050 targets looming ever larger, we see uh, setups like this as integral to, to decarbonizing Ireland. Um, there's a huge amount of investment that is involved in something like this. It was co-funded by us, um, Gas Networks Ireland and the European Union. So it's something we're really proud of. So for us, in terms of really seeing the linear economy and the circular economy and the benefits to, to decarbonizing Ireland on the left hand side, you'll see what was the linear, linear economy up above. So an organization has food waste um, and at the moment it's either being composted, which is a grand solution for it, um, or it's been taken to a Northern Irish AD or British um, AD plant. But the, the, the energy that is um, the energy from that then is either being is it is being injected into the Northern Irish gas grid and the very sort of basis of sustainability is that if the product is taken out of the state or across borders, then it becomes unsustainable. So that's no harm to anyone. But if there were if there were supports in the south, like there are for um, renewable gas suppliers in the north, then there would be no issue there. Then on the right hand side um, for Green Generation, we as an organization, we take in the food waste we process it, we make it into renewable gas and we send it back to the organization and they have um, first refusal on whether they want to buy that gas back. And the trick with renewable gas is that uh, volume for volume, you get the same amount of gas back that the, your, your feedstock goes in. So you're not losing anything in the process. So while all the, there are other AD plants um, across the country, um, upgrading that to combined heat and power loses up to about 40 percent um power in the process um in terms of driving down emissions uh, all of our fleet our entire fleet of hgvs you'll see them on the bottom right there are all powered by um biogas the gas vehicle network in the uk said that there is no other sector in the uk economy where large co2 emissions can be so quickly and so effectively implemented as the hgv network so long long distance truck sector um, is primed to be used to use sorry biogas. I have a little Volkswagen Caddy at the back that runs on CNG and it runs like a dream. But um, we really need uh, more support to get more of these stations opened. Um, Gas Networks Ireland do stellar work in Ireland, and they've they've two stations at the minute. One is um, at Dublin Port, and the other one is in Cashel. Um, so there's nine stations planned over the next couple of years. 
Sadly, none of them are planned for Donegal, but I'll keep working on that. Um, and then phase two of that particular project um, hopes to roll out 21 public stations eventually. So we really will be harnessing um, the power of renewable gas if we get more of this sort of thinking. Um, just to do a, a sort of a fairly simple calculation, and we would, you know, tell all of our customers this um, green, green generation to Dublin return is 132 kilometers um, and over a, a, annually over a year. So that's just under 14,000 kilometers traveled by using biogas trucks, such as the ones we have in green generation, you have the potential to cut about um, over 11,000 kilograms of CO2 emissions every year. So that's from the commercial fleet.org in the UK. And that in terms of my part of my job is really explaining what all this means, what all this technical jargon means is that um, using biogas trucks over the course of a year is the same as planting 806 trees. So again, it's a win-win. You're using a problem to solve another problem. So we really see that circularity um, and its benefits. For us, in terms of continual innovation, um, we've developed a process with our plastics partner, Paltec, who are another Irish company based in Galway, um, to be able to process hard and soft plastics into new products. Um, since taking over the Tesco food waste um, contract, we've pivoted and put a huge effort into R&D. So we're, we've developed, and Paltec have developed technology to process this mixed waste plastics into high value products. Um, these products are both 100% recycled and 100% recyclable, which is great. Um, Paltec are a company in Galway that were founded in 2018 who have just a vast amount of experience in, in everything to do with plastics, about 120 years combined. Um, and I often laugh when, when people ask me about the Paltex partnership. Paltex bring the brains and Green Generation bring the brawn. So there's a really nice partnership there. And it, it's something that we're going to drive forward in the next couple of years. Paltec have also been awarded the Green Enterprise Grant for innovation for the circular economy. Um, and these are our products that we have in the pipeline. So the motorway bollards on the left hand side, um, all made from mixed waste plastics. Um, these motorway bollards are, we're having them tested in Italy at the minute for their CE testing and reports back so far have been fantastic. So we're just waiting on the official results there. Um, for every kilometer of these motorway bollards, you'd be using 166 tons of mixed waste plastic. So taking that amount of plastic out of the environment um, is, is only going to be positive. In the middle then we have telegraph poles, which I actually don't know how many telegraph poles there are around the country, but traditionally they would be made from timber and they would be treated in creosote um, and creosote soon to be, I think it is actually 2021, it's going to be banned across Europe. So there's an awful lot of thinking and a lot, an awful lot of research and design that go into these products. And then the last one on the right hand side is our cladding. So this is cladding that you might've seen around Tesco stores. So this really is the circular economy in action where we take Tesco's plastics, their food waste wrapped in plastic and send them back plastic cladding that they have installed um, in their stores nationwide, which is a really good story. These are our partners that we work really closely with. Tesco, as we all know, have been a great partner of ours and they've, you know, Tesco have been thinking outside of the box for a few years now and have really um, upped the ante for all food waste in Ireland. So they've proven with us uh, that food can be used, the food waste can be used for um, for better things, for, for making renewable gas. Um, so I think they should be applauded on that. Gas Networks Ireland, much the same. We partner really closely with them. Um, and I suppose the most exciting part now for our business is working with Paltec and, and driving those projects forward. Um, in terms of next steps for us, and Billy will touch on a lot of this now in a second, we're really hoping to up cross-industry stakeholder engagement because I was at a, side note, I was at a renewable energy summit um, a week ago um, the, and there was no mention of the Irish bioeconomy until late into the session. So I think if we're to make our 2030 and 2050 targets, we need to be start we need to start thinking about them now and really put a bit of urgency in there because we need 
solar, wind and hydro are getting a huge amount of um, exposure, but I think uh, renewable gas really needs to be up there because we're, we're going to need all sources of renewable energy if we're going to get anywhere. Um, continuous really communication of the opportunities and the solutions. So while food waste is an awful scourge, we've, we've found a way of really pulling some value out of there and the same thing with the plastics. Um, government and policymaker involvement, involvement is key, and that's where the likes of Verbia and um, other uh, lobbyists come into it. So we really need to continue the push. And I think possibly even while, while we live, in, we're in an industry where everybody knows what we're talking about, I think we need to invite other um, external stakeholders and the general public along with us. So part of my job is really breaking down that language to make sure that everybody's along for the ride. Um, we have Science Foundation and EPA projects are ongoing and continuing. And we as a company are, are setting about building a movement around doing the right thing. So what we want is, is a future where renewable energy is the way to go. So we'll be building a, mu a movement over the next month. Um, we'd like anyone and everyone, whether you're a large company or a small company, to get in touch with us um, and to join us on that journey. Uh, once restrictions lift, we'd love to have people back on site because I think I could talk until the cows come home about what we do, but actually seeing it in action um, is really important. Um, and also, I was speaking to the guys in Paltech and we have some of these uh, plastic coasters. So if you're interested in what we are doing, in the, on the plastic side of the business, please do get in touch. My email is there. So just flick me an email and ask me for a couple of coasters and I'll send them down to you, whether they come in coaster form or not, uh, will is soon to be seen. Um, any questions at all, please reach out to us. That's my email address. You can get us on our website. We're across all four major um, social media platforms and we'll take questions from there. Thank you, Sean. That's great. Um, thanks very much, Teresa, for your very interesting presentation. Um, I think you have certainly uh, shown the work that Green Generation is doing in terms of the circular economy um, and um, across many particular aspects, um, not alone the biogas area. Um, so could I ask Noel and Billy to turn on your cameras if possible? No. And Billy? <clears throat> I think Teresa has me switched off. Teresa, can you switch on Billy's camera? Teresa O'Brien? No. Lovely. No, okay, now we see you, Billy. Thanks, Teresa. Um, Okay, well, look, we'll make a start. Um, there's a number of questions coming in through the Q&A um, tab at the bottom of the screen and continue to feed forward your questions. But before we begin, maybe just, um, Billy, we quickly bring you into the conversation and um, just a quick uh, quick chat for a couple of minutes. Um, in 2019, Airbnb launched a paper, policy paper around what was required to mobilize an industry. Um, since then, we have lobbied continuously to uh, try and get the government to implement a support scheme for, for biogas to bridge the gap between the fossil gas price and the production cost of biogas. Um, our efforts continue in this regard and we are seeing little willingness at a government level to uh, fund or to uh, provide support. Uh, would that be the indication you're getting yourself or have you any insights into, um, into the, the potential for a support scheme to be launched in the near future? It doesn't seem to be very much interest at national level to to um, get involved in biomethane. That now it's developed in the court in October, whereby the English um, are allowed to take in Irish biomethane now, and that means that uh, it doesn't really matter what the Irish government do. Irish biomethane can go to England, but it isn't great for Ireland Inc. Mm. It, for an individual uh, who wants to do it now. Part of the problem with it is that. There's no guarantee of the payment you get in England, so our bogeyman, the bank, will probably not want to finance it. But, but when you fix one problem, you open another one. Okay. Um, and then just as a follow-on to that, Billy, we talk about um, 
an exchequer support or a market driven support. Um, and just a, an interesting question in here from Parik, and um, it kind of opens up a, a discussion about the, the other areas uh, in terms of funding. In order to stimulate a biogas industry, and given that our government shows a reluctance to adequately support it, do you see a way to create a viable industry through, um, through <clears throat> do you see, we see a way to create a viable industry um, from the non-energy byproducts of AD, such as credit for emissions reduction, selling digested, better nutrient nitrogen management, water quality management, and phosphorus recovery. In many EU countries, uh, slurry is processed, manure is processed, and this is subsidized. But presumably green generation make money partly through gate fees for processing waste and partly through refit for CHP. So would you be able to comment on, can we make this work in combination with the support scheme with the non-energy benefits being, being valued or being adequately valued? It's not easy to make much out of the non-energy benefits. But they're a great thing, what it's doing. It's good for the environment and it's good for all of that. Now, one thing the government could do is that every European country has to put in a percentage of renewable fuel into their fuel. So in yes. right around Europe, they're putting in 10 and 12 percent uh, renewable into their diesel and their petrol. Ireland is still stuck at five. Now, we're possibly going to go to 10 this year because the British are going to 10. And that means that the Shell and BP and all the carbon or the oil producers have to buy in something. They, they have to either buy 10 or 10 or 10 percent renewables. Um, whether it's cooking oil or they have to blend something with it. Now, what they can do, and which would be no cost to the Irish exchequer at all, is like they do in England, they could take the uh, certificates that are produced by a biomethane producer and they could use those to offset instead of buying cooking oil from China or, or from Malaysia, because it's, it's totally crazy to take cooking oil out of, Mal out of Malaysia and China and bring it to Rotterdam and put it into diesel supposed to cut down the emissions in Europe, while at the same time, you're meaning the people out in China have to say, well, we give away our coconut oil to Europe, so now we'll use a diesel instead. So you're as well to use the diesel in China, in, in Ireland as you are to do it in China. It's the one, the one atmosphere we're all under. So the government could make a decision this minute at absolutely no cost to the government if the minister said, right, let's increase it to 10% and let's allow gaseous, uh, which is the, the certificates generated by biomethane, be used to offset it, like they are in every other country in Europe. And uh, it's a stroke of a pain by the minister to do it. And for some reason, it's not happening. And it would mean you could make biomethane in Ireland. You could sell your certificates to Shell and BP instead of them bringing in the coconut oil from China. And it sounds like it'd be good, or do, it would be like doing the right thing. So it's up to the minister to grab it and say, right, it's not costing nothing. It's not a cent going out of the exchequer's pocket. Is that? And would that go far enough, do you think, to to providing the supports required to make it viable? So it's able to do it in England on the RTFO scheme. So you're basically the same thing. Okay. You know, we've no advantage in Ireland. If, if, if cooking oil has to come, it will generally come to Rotterdam and then it has to come to England or come to Ireland. So we're further than England. So the English can make it work. Why can't we? It doesn't cost the government anything in England. Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, and I know that uh, there has been a number of consultations around the biofuels obligation scheme. And we have, um, from an earlier perspective, we had fed back through that there was a need to um, look into this area and uh, allow biomethane to be used as a, as a fuel and uh, the scheme to be broadened to provide a a mechanism by which supports could be provided. Okay. One final question before before we um, move back to Teresa and um, Billy. A lot of farmers that I would meet, being a part-time farmer myself, would be um, wondering about the digestate as a biofertilizer. Um, can you give us some of your own thoughts on that? Um, do you think it should be the potential for it to be processed further in terms of um, uh, maybe dried and um, being bagged uh, or is it we, we've seen through the farm to fork strategy there's a significant drive in terms of targets to reduce the amount of chemical fertilizer which are being 
um, used on farms. This is obviously an alternative. Um, so what's your thoughts on the whole use of digested from a farming perspective? Oh, it's excellent. Uh, where we are, the, the, the pepper farmers uh, have used the digestate and, rather than the pig slurry. Drying it would be difficult because it takes a lot of energy to do it and really you take it in and you put it out in the field and you let the rain wet it again. So there isn't really a big gain in drying it. It means you can transport it further if you dry it, but it's not that necessary to do it. But the, the quality of the digestate is um, people really want it. I, an interesting funny thing was that in the local pub beside the one day, there was a guy in, he said that digestate is not any good compared to the pig slurry. So I happened to meet him the next day and I said, I hear you're cutting, cutting the legs from under the digestate. He was actually getting digestate. And I said, why? He said, I don't want them coming in here for it. He says, I want to get them. He wanted it. So he was basically <laughs> downplaying it, but it has. It, it wouldn't, yeah. There's a neighbor beside it down here. He's, he's a qualified uh, ag himself. And he has switched over to nearly 100% um, digestate. He's bought the equipment and done it correctly. And he's cut out his chemical fertilizer bill almost fully. So it is great to see that. It takes a time. It's a learning experience for people to, like pig story and digest it, we're always considered waste. And we'll throw on a bit of that and then we put on the bag fertilizer as well. In, in Europe and in England, they utilize it correctly and put it on when the crop is grown. And you finish up with a great fertilizer. So it is all the part plus. Okay, thanks, Billy. Um, okay, we'll go back to you, Teresa, uh, just to address maybe some of the questions there and we can bring Billy in on some of them as well. Um, just uh, the first one there from Mary um, is, is is green generation and networking with groups like the Irish Farmers Association. I know we have a rep or two from the Irish Farmers Association online. So, um, and Arabia certainly would be liaising very closely with the IFA in terms of um, our efforts to lobby for support scheme for um, an AD industry. So Teresa, would you be able to answer that one or Billy? Billy probably would be the best man. I have had no direct contact with the Irish Farmers Association, but I believe there's a... There's oh, we would. Uh, now that now that the IFA have put a famous pig farmer in charge, we have a very, very short contact with Mr. Cullinan and he is fully aware of everything, has visited the plant and understands the full ramifications of it and is very supportive. I understand he's a very supportive all right of AD and so that's good and positive um, a question for from Donald there um, in terms of distance um, the H heavy goods vehicle can travel on a tank of biogas um, what sort of I think uh, they can about, about 300 kilometers uh, on CNG and if you if you switch to LNG they can do about 1100 kilometers so they can do three to four hundred kilometers, and they're getting better all the time. And my just a, on a non HGV, um, my little caddy out the back. If I fill it up in Dublin Port, will take me up to Dublin two and a half times for around, I think it's thirty one euros that you pay Circle K. So the mileage on it is is pretty phenomenal. Okay, um, a question there, um, maybe Tracy or Billy. Um, Great presentation. Um, is there a potential in using residential food waste as a source for biogas production? And if yes, what are the ste steps to tap into this resource? So, um, I, I'll take that one. Um, there's there's definitely the potential there. Um, the what what really what's great for us on the commercial side it is that there's there's very little contamination there to be worrying about. Um, and with the best will in the world more often than not domestic food waste um, bins have would have a little bit more contamination in there so it's just a bit of a worry for us we're doing work around um, uh, the contamination piece as well in that we're trying to get it out of there before we put it into the digesters and um, we're speaking to a number of waste management companies on this problem um, and I suppose if, if we were to go the domestic route we would need the support of either county councils or whoever's in charge. You know, the, I've just moved from Dublin and I've, I've never had a, a brown bin for my food waste in Dublin. Moved up to Donegal and got one straight away. So while there's the potential there, we also need to have the background support in getting people brown waste, um, sorry, organic waste bins sorted. Billy, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, there is, there is potential there. Uh, having the farm in Germany, I've seen it for years, in Germany, the, the um, brown bin being used, and 
you could open the brown bin in Germany and it was a bit like a salad. It was just all food. There was no nappy. There was no nothing. They, they, it's good education and well done. Now, there probably will need to move in Ireland away from giving somebody a brown bin that's the same size as your black bin or the same size as your blue bin because unless you had a family of about 50, you couldn't fill it in a, in a week. So what happens is people only put it out once a month, which means by the time they put it out, it's gone bad and rotten and it's no use to the biogas plant. So again, you need to move down to a smaller type caddy bin and the people can put it out weekly and that it's fresh food and it's collected correctly. You know, they, they have ways of putting uh, a small compartment on the, on one of those bin lorries that can take just the food part. And again, it's great. It should be used. It's, it's a pity because it's creating methane and gases if you don't do it. But everybody gets the same size bin for everything, so you won't go out and there's only six inches on the bottom of it. Okay. Um, thanks, Billy, for that. And I think the big point is probably education and awareness of the yeah. domestic householder in terms of the importance of, of frank segregation. Will. Young people will eventually, children and that. There should be a lot of work put into that, show them how what should go in the bin and get it done. And now that will take okay. a number of years, but it's, it's the way to do it. Um, we're also joined by Noel Gavigan this morning, um, who's our technical executive. I'll bring you in, Noel, and a couple of the questions further on, um, if you don't mind. So uh, another question here from Tony, and it's kind of similar. Um, all plastic and other contaminated rem contamination is removed from food waste feedstock. Does that rely on hand picking? Um, I suppose it's a process question, Billy. Yeah, it does. If, uh, if you want to do it correctly, you have there's a more a higher labour content in doing it correctly. If you take the whole waste food and just throw it into a separator, you will get the food separated partially from it, but you're left in with a residue of cardboard and plastic and food, and generally that goes to incineration. So what we are finding is that the people want us to say, right, let's try and not have anything going to incineration or landfill, and that's what we guarantee them. And uh, by doing that, you have to take some of the heavier plastic out early. And I saw earlier the tweets there now, I'm not criticised now, but she said that plastic is bad. I wouldn't agree that plastic is bad, that uh, plastic saves food and creates it correctly. And of the oil that comes out of the ground, 5% of the oil goes into making plastic. And 95% of the oil goes into making heat and transport. And heat and burning it in heat and transport, and that's the worst use of oil you can have. The 5% that goes into plastic is no problem at all. It's an excellent product until you burn it. And when you burn it, now you're back worse than ever. So if you could avoid burning the plastic, it's a great product. Even single use plastic, you're all fine. If you can then, at the end of life, put them into something as we say, like with those bottles, sequestered there, in 50 years time, when there's no oil in the oceans and there's no oil around, they can take up the bollards that we are putting in there, producing, and they can recycle them and say, now we'll make our plastic bags from the bollards because there'll be nobody driving cars, they'll be all robots and they won't need a barrier in the middle of the road to stop them from hitting each other. <laughs> and we'll be all dead by then. Okay. Um... Thanks, Billy. Just two follow-on questions on that from Tony as well. Um, do green generation monitor physically contamination the food waste substrate, and how much organic materials pass to the plastic passes to the plastic feedstock for recycling, and how is it how is this material recovered? Well, the waste food that goes into with the plastic, we put it through a washing process, and the waste food that's washed back goes back into the biogas plant, so it's completely circular. So if we take waste plastic off mechanically. We then bring it to the plastic plant, it's given a, a washing, and the dirty water comes straight back into the biogas. So it's, we're not losing any part of it, and it, it works fine. Okay. Um, question there um, for you, maybe, uh, Teresa. How does one upgrade biogas to renewable gas? So yeah. that's just um, our biomethane. So it's probably an easy one to answer. Um, through an upgrader. Um, I definitely don't have the technical background to get into the huge detail of that, but we have an upgrader on site um, that upgrades the biogas to renewable gas and then it's taken down to Kush. Um, Des, I'm happy to get in touch with Des yeah, about that question and fill in, fill in all the blanks. So Des, if you want to send me an email, um, I'll touch base with you on that. Okay, thanks for that, um, Teresa. Um, 
A question here, maybe I'll bring in Noel and also Billy to comment on this. Maybe Billy first and then Noel. Um, given the mixture of the materials you digest, are there restrictions on the use of the digestive and agricultural land or in quality assurance schemes? So maybe Billy first and then maybe Noel, you can come in on the whole ABP There's area. There are restrictions and they, they actually tell me that in the next um, couple of years, they may consider the product of the digestive because it's pasteurized to be used on organic farms. And we tested for heavy metals and we tested for everything and we don't take in human sewage and uh, we have no, it's passing all the tests. Noel, can you just give an outline of the ABP regulation and how we sit on a forum, an ABP yeah. forum, and the importance of that from an AD perspective? Yeah, we've, we've been sitting on the ABP forum, which is a Department of Agriculture group involving Department of Agriculture, Department of Environment, EPA, and different uh, waste providers and recyclers and involved in the biogas sector and in the composting. And it sets out all of the requirements for animal byproducts and how you ensure that you don't, you know, you're, 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 proper biological control it's a well a very well uh, regulated um scenario at this stage uh, like billy and every other plant would have a, a an animal byproducts license and basically any former animal product be it slurry or be it a, a former meat product or milk will need to be um be properly treated going through the plant now in terms of once it comes out the far side you very effectively recycle those nutrients and um, you've removed any potential biological um, contaminant in it, you know, we're talking about a bacteria or a virus that might pass through. So the, the, the process uh, through pasteurization or um, high temperature treatments gets rid of that. And then um, effectively you have a very good material. The only restrictions that you come across is if you're using something that's not animal waste or not crop waste. So for example, um, the quality assurance schemes don't want to see say human sludge going in. So from wastewater treatments. Now, Technically, there's nothing wrong with that material going into uh, going back out onto land, but it's really a marketing thing. We don't want, um, you know, when we're marketing our food worldwide, people don't like the idea of food waste being used to grow that crop. So um, technically, you could use that, but we it tends not to be used because there's a in the quality assurance schemes because it has a, you know, it visually or it doesn't for the customer they don't like to see that, but it, you know, for customers of our food. But no, the, the bypass regulations are, are very um, robust and, and they work very well here in the country. Okay, and just to um, let attendees mm -hmm. know that uh, webinar number 10 um, was one we did uh, a number of months back and we had Stephen Nolan from Green Generation presented that. And he um, presented some very interesting figures around the research work that he has done in the whole area of digestive and, and indeed on um, this particular area. So. I'd encourage people to look back at webinar number 10, the recording of that on our website uh, to get further information on this particular area. A um, couple of questions there. Um, biogas use in tractors. Um, I see that New Holland has recently launched a prototype tractor for biomethane. Do you want to comment on that, Billy, as a potential area of the future? Well, you or can. Teresa? You can. You can. There are tractors available for it. It's getting, keeping it filled and doing all that, that would be the problem. You know, okay. it's a habit it's a flight. Um, Just a, a comment here, maybe, uh, why would exporting a sustainable fuel from a country make it unsustainable? Um, um, I suppose I'll take that one just during my research for the thesis is that the, the definition of sustainability means meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So, the circular economy is it really about it's not about keeping what we have but it's really making sure that we keep the the good sources of feedstock that we have so once something changes so if i send something over to holland it becomes unsustainable because it's it's cross borders so in a in an irish context sustainability means keeping that within the country so that we can meet the needs of future generations to come okay um thanks teresa the costs associated, a question from Anthony, the costs associated with converting a heavy goods vehicle to biogas, um, can that be done? You don't, you don't really convert it. You, you buy a new truck that has ready for gas. You don't convert the existing one. So they are more expensive to buy, but the fuel is cheaper to run. And I think uh, over three years, it pays for itself. And from then on, you have a cheaper fuel. You know, okay. once the stations are in place, I think that you will find a bigger, bigger increase. In the big increase in big time in England. Okay, um, 
Thanks, Billy. Um, question from Donal. Um, again, it's regard to the, um, the sludge from wastewater treatment plants. Uh, Irish Water is putting in central sludge plants around the country. Um, I know we have a member that's processing a sludge um, in a biogas plant. Um, so, Billy do, would, or Teresa, would you like to comment on that um, in terms of its potential for biogas? We, we don't take in any human yeah. sewage, um, but I do think, you know, all of the human, human sewage in Ireland is con controlled by Irish water. And uh, uh, Noel was right there that uh, if the image of human sewage where cows eating green grass doesn't come across very well to some customer in China buying baby food. So we shouldn't have that, but it's all controlled by one group. So they should possibly directed into nine or ten large biogas plants and mix it with some grass and put it out on on grassland that is not being used mm -hmm. for uh, food production mm -hmm. like they do in other countries and then you you're keeping it inside a sector and it's a business and it's being treated correctly okay um thanks billy um a question here, and it's a follow-on, and probably maybe we've discussed and answered before from Robert. Um, the levels of contamination, heavy metals and other present in spent digestate, are there issues with land spreading fertilizer? And again, I'd encourage Robert to look back at webinar number 10. But Teresa or Billy, do you want to comment on that? Just um, Well, we, we test our digestate for heavy metals and for all that. And I think one of the benefits we have of hand-picking some of the products is that they find in a lot of places that it's where you put a lot of cardboard into the biogas, into the digestive, which is an organic material that can happen. That can lead to heavy metals. But we, 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 uh, we pick off the cardboard as well and we bail it and we recycle that. So I think that probably keeps our, hit, our heavy metal levels lower. Okay. Um, question here, quite a technical one. Um, are CNG vehicles not less efficient than these, their diesel equivalents? And thus, while CNG is less carbon intensive uh, than diesel per megajoule, more CNG is required to travel the same distance, which reduces the GHG savings. So maybe it's more of a comment than a question. Yeah. It's probably mixing up uh, CNG, which is compressed natural gas, and also using uh, biomethane. You know, it's a, a CNG in itself is a fossil fuel. So therefore, you know, there might be, I don't know whether it's a, the efficiency causes that, that as, as stated there, but um, you're still using a fossil fuel, fuel if you're using CNG, mm -hmm. but if you're using biomethane, it's um, a different, you know, it's a, a renewable source. Okay, um, thanks Noel. Um, thanks Richard for joining us this morning. Um, really good presentation and um, I'd like to recommend it to others. When will it be up on the website? So the recording, this webinar has been recorded like all of our webinars. And in the coming days, uh, the recording will be live on our the erbia.org website. And also, um, I think the link will be circulated to all attendees this morning. So um, we'd be happy for you to refer people to our website for, to, to view the, the recording. Um, question on carbon dioxide recovery. Um, Teresa, do you want to take that for Billy? Um, is carbon dioxide recovery recovered and what is it used for? Um, so. Is, it can source be of renewable CO2. Yeah, it's not, it, when you upgrade the biomethane or the biogas into biomethane, a byproduct is CO is CO2, and it's an investment of about a million pound, and you can recover the CO2 and deliver it around the country. It's another it's another step. It probably should be done. And uh, Ireland imports all of the CO2 at present. We don't have well uh, Guinness makes some of it or Diageo, but we we import the majority of it for animal slaughter and for food and for everything. So it is something to look at. If you had enough time and enough money, you could go and do it and it probably should be done. Okay, so it's another added value potentially to the process, but it's like all of all of this, you have to have a plant in place first and then you can add to it. Cool. Um, so and we, we're at the first step in terms of getting plants in place across the country. Obviously you're yeah. in a position that you have your plant, but there's others that are looking to get their plants up and running. And um, there's a couple of comments around uh, your initial comments, Billy, on the search for the biomethane, how it's currently allowed and counted in the biofuels obligation scheme. So just yeah. to clarify on that, we have... Well, I understood. That was my understanding of it. That, um, the certific certificate from Gaseous Fuel 
aren't allowed under the um, obligation scheme in Ireland. Now, I stand correct if they are, but I understood they weren't, so I'll check that out. I saw that comment and I... Yeah, well, we have a, long, a number of comments here um, confirming that they are allowed. Um, so just to clarify on that, um, from a couple of different... Um, if they are, and we'll, we'll check it out. But it's a case of further developing and expanding on this um, to to ensure that it returns in terms of a viable um, re return that will potentially help in terms of the economics. Noel, do you want to comment on the biofuels obligation scheme um, in terms of biomethane? Well, yeah, it's been going for some time now, basically, that obliges your fuel importer to uh, add in a certain percentage of biofuel. Uh, alternatively, so what they are using is, is uh, biodiesel and ethanol. Um, but the, that's becoming in, in tight supply and uh, as Billy said you know you have a lot of oils coming in from the far side of the world which is not definitely not sus sustainable and, as, as Teresa was pointing out in, in the definition of it and it's questionable whether uh, the portion of that coming from palm oil we do have a, a biodiesel facility here in Ireland that works uh, very very well and produces that out of recycled materials um, but you don't know when it's coming from far afield how sustainable it is um, what you can do is you can use certificates generated from from biomethane and um, so where you do have you're producing biomethane in a plant like green generations uh, using that in in trucks or cars and those certs uh, that, that generates uh, their virtual cert and they can be sold onto the fuel importer now i suppose what's lacking at the minute is an open market for trading those certs because it, it, it's um there is no open forum for, for buying those so trading those is, is a difficulty at the minute um, when you're dealing with the importers, they're dealing in, you know, they want not even a million certs, they want 10 to 100 million certs when, when they're doing a purchase. So it, it's a difficult when you're a biogas company look, looking at that sort of scale. Um, okay. But that, in theory, it's there. Okay, thanks, uh, Noel. And just as a follow on comment from that, mm. um, from James Cogan, um, I believe they're allowed, but not as cheap as using cooking oil. Reportedly, reporting is obligatory, so we'll soon see from Nora what 2,000 volumes were. So just thanks, James, for your feedback on that. Um, question here, Teresa or Billy. Mm -hmm. um, some people were saying that, that they run their car on gas. Um, can they fill up in Kush? So my understanding is that it's an injection point only. They have to go to a fill-in station to get the gas. Is that correct? Or? That's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so okay. down there's a there's um, a filling station at the Dublin port and another one in Casho, and then G and I are going to be rolling out another nine over the next twelve months. We are looking at putting a filling point at the Cush. Uh, you have to add, um, you have to add a, a smell factor to it to make sure that the cars have it. So we will be doing that over the next period of time and having it there that people can. Okay. Whether it'll be open all the time or not, I don't know, but we'll, we'll see. Okay, thanks, Billy. A question specifically to you. Uh, how do you see the biomethane market in Ireland developing? What's the best commercial avenue? And would, what would be the best avenue for, for environmental impact? So um, just... Well, if the, the government decided that they wanted to solve the climate situation, we're a great grass-growing country. We have plenty of rain and we have plenty of good grass grown. We could grow an awful lot more grass right around the country and at present, the problem is that if you expand in the capital side, you know, it's not that very profitable. And you, if you have more capital, you might lose more money. So there, if there was an outlet there for a farmer to say, right, I'll divert, divert a certain amount of my crop, my crop, uh, field to an energy crop, possibly they could do it, but it needs government leadership and somebody to say, yes, we want to do it. Okay. Um... Yes, fully agree with you, Billy. That that's the what's what's required. Um, I'm not sure if we, if and maybe it's a question from Seamus and Teresa. Maybe you know something about this, or and maybe we have to get back to Seamus. Can you summarize the present status of organic fertilizer EU regulation? When and how will they be used? So, I suppose that's in reference um, to the gestate. Yeah, I might get um, Seamus to just flick me an email at Teresa at greengeneration.ie and we can discuss that further because I know Stephen Nolan, um, our plant manager, has done a huge amount of a huge body of work around that. So we'd be happy to answer his questions there. Okay. Um, question from um, Julian. 
What alternative does the government back to bio CNG LNG for heavy goods transport? If it is hydrogen, how long will it take for that to be deployed? Can biogas have a role in hydrogen production? Yes, hydrogen, uh, biogas, you can use it to make hydrogen. It's a good few years down the road yet because it's a bit more difficult process. If they want, if they want to subsidize um, biogas, it's hard to see them subsidizing hydrogen, but it, it is probably the future. Hydrogen will be something that maybe in 10 or 20 years time. And hydrogen from offshore wind as well and other, other gener sources uh, yes, generate yes. from other sources. Yeah, you make it when the, when the wind is not being used, you can make, make, the, make the hydrogen. Sometimes then they add the hydrogen into a biogas plant and it creates better quality biomethane and then you put it into the gas grid. So it's, it's a way of, at night time, if the wind is blowing and we have no use for the heat, for the electricity, you could use that surplus electricity to make hydrogen, inject it into a biogas plant, it floats up to the top as high quality CH4, then you put it into the gas grid and now you would store. You see, you can't store electricity, that's the problem. If you're very windy night, you, you have nothing you can't store, whereas with this process, you could. Okay. Um, one last, it's more of a comment than a question um, on the questions, and there's a couple of things in the chat which should just highlight. Um, general comments to previous question, we use CH CNG vehicles, ranges 550 to 600 kilometers on a full tank. Consumption per 100 kilometers is approximately 10% more efficient than our diesel trucks. So just an interesting um, comment there, and thanks to the person that, that provided that um, comment to us. Um, we're at our time limit, unfortunately. Just a couple of uh, follow-on uh, points um, that have come, come through. Um, thanks, Joe, for your uh, comment, and I'm sure that we, Teresa will be in touch um, about maybe making a presentation given to various local um, stakeholders, which would be important. So thanks, Joe, for your comment. Um, I suppose the, we have a couple of comments again on the biofuels obligation scheme and how the SARS can be claimed on the bio, under the biofuels obligation scheme to so just clarify on that. Um, and then just a, another clar clarification or comment here uh, from Shane um, that all biofuels placed in the market in Ireland is sustainable as per the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, so just to uh, a comment on that. And finally, and the last question, I suppose, comes back to the original question, which we asked you, Billy, and it's back to a question from Tim. Um, he's asking the panel if we have any further information on if the government plan to introduce a subsidy for gas to grid in the near future. So that is the fundamental question, I suppose. And just a little bit of insight into that. Um, Erbia has met with, the, with Minister Ryan in, um, in the last couple of weeks. And the general sense of it that we got from the meeting was that there is no support scheme um, being considered in the short term. Um, that's the general feedback that we got from the meeting we had with the minister. So as an industry, um, we have, um, or as a representative body from an Arabia perspective, we are, uh, we have fought, re reformed or um, relaunched our biogas uh, policy group. And we have to now look to see are there other ways by which we can try and generate um, um, a return for biogas production, but at the same time continue our lobbying efforts to for the introduction of a support scheme um, from the government, uh, either through market driven supports or exchequer supports for a gas to grid. So I leave maybe just for the final comments, Billy, would you like to make a final comment on this as a concluding remark? I go to Teresa then and then yeah. go to Noel. So based on what you said there, it's a bit disappointing to think that uh, Eamon Ryan would be in the same box now as Danny Healy Ray as regards if he doesn't want to see it. it maybe, there, maybe, maybe we all have it wrong and there is no climate problem. We don't need to do anything it's because I think we do. And I think we should use the resources we have. And, I think it's a knowledge base. I've invited Minister Ryan a number of times to come to see the biogas plant and to understand what we do, because in my discussions with him, he seemed to have it, uh, picked up a little bit wrong in Northern Ireland, in that he was of the understanding that the biogas plants were the cause of all the chicken farms in Northern Ireland. And that was his feedback, whereas it was the other way around. The biogas plants were built to utilize the product from the chicken farm. So I think it was just maybe misinformation and I'd be delighted if he'd come sometime and see it.
and maybe you'll come to him, Sean. No problem, yeah, we can do that, Billy, certainly, and try and get that organized. Teresa, a concluding remark from yourself, do you want to? Sort of on the, on the same note as Billy, um, I was speaking to a peer last week who had said years ago, they went to a bioeconomy um, lecture and the, the opening slide was burning forests. So I think there's a there's somewhere along the line there communication has failed the bioeconomy in Ireland. So really um, refocusing on all sources of renewable energy is where Ireland needs to be. So while hydro, solar and um, wind are all great, we need gas to be in there as well if we're going to make these targets. So like Billy, happy we'd be happy to get Minister Ryan down on the site and just really try to um, I mean, repackage the, the message that we're trying to get out there. Okay, Noel, do you want to just, have you any concluding remarks and maybe just allude to the different scales of biogas production that's, that's potentially... Yeah, um, I mean, the plant that Billy has, it's, it's very much geared for taking in slurry from the, the pig farm beside him and also um, predominantly the food waste. And there is a real need for recycling all of our food waste, all of our brown bin waste um, and uh, food processing material into biogas at facilities like that and at that scale. Um, and there, we really do need them to be supported, both for, in terms of waste policy as well as in um, energy policy. And on the other sc scale, then in the, the farm scale, we're doing a project on that, which there is a, a webinar on. I forget the actual number there, Sean, you might have in front of you, but the, um, where we are looking at on farm plants, this is going back to some of the basic plants that were built back in the, the 80s, where you're looking at just using the on site material, so be it slurry be it uh, chicken litter, um, to produce enough energy for on-site needs. And it's an entirely different scale. It's not looking at the industrial. It's basically a, a small on-farm plant. So we are doing quite a bit of work on that. And there is more information on, on that webinar. Yeah. And that's webinar number nine, Noel. So okay. if number anyone nine. wants to look back, um, the details are available. So I think um, we're at the end of our webinar this morning. Um, our work continues from an Irish Bioenergy uh, Association perspective in terms of uh, trying to mobilize an industry. It's great to see um, Billy and Teresa and Green Generation uh, developing further, progressing further and really driving the circular economy. I thank uh, Teresa for a very insightful presentation. I also thank Billy for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us this morning. Um, and um, I also thank Noel for joining us on the, on the panel. Um, behind the scenes, uh, Teresa O'Brien uh, ensures that all this happens smoothly. So I'd like to specifically um, mention Teresa and, and thank you for your, your uh, ongoing work to roll out this um, webinar series. Um, so, uh, and finally, I'd just like to thank all our participants this morning. We had a very large attendance this morning, uh, a lot of questions, a lot of feedback. Um, I hope we've answered uh, all of your questions as best we could. Uh, and if you have any follow on questions for Teresa uh, or indeed for Arbia, feel free to get in touch uh, with us and um, view the, you can circulate the link to the recording um, when that is published. So uh, on that, um, we will conclude and just to say we uh, keep safe and uh, thank you for joining us and we look forward to welcoming you uh, to our next webinar in two weeks time. Thank you. you know, bye. Thank you.